Let us move into the news. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Nelson, South American, all the ships and clippers at sea. Let's go to France, Florida. Mm-hmm. First up, we've got some crossover sort of video game tabletop uh, role playing entering into the board gaming world. Uh, two major brands in the nerdery world, Critical Role and Blizzard, have both announced that they are creating their own, uh, what would we call it, a publishing house? Yeah. Yeah, they're creating their own their line of board games. Their own press. Yeah, so Critical Role, if uh, you don't know them, they are sort of the kings and queens of um, Dungeons & Dragons, the podcast, right? I mean, it's... Or Twitch, or, Twitch I guess, streaming, yeah. Twitch streaming, yeah. So people love following their exploits on role-playing, and they are all uh, little uh, it's tabletop. A thing. It's a big thing. Yeah, it's a big thing. They're all celebrities And they're in expanding their the right. hobby. Like, Critical Role has been great at bringing new people in to the into Dungeons and & Dragons and the role-playing game hobby in general. So they have their own line of board games coming out. Trey, did you look at any of these that they've announced? Uh, I saw the one, which is what? I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, Ukatoa? I'll Ukatoa, go Ukatoa. Yeah. 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 And, Three uh, to five players from Jeb Havens and Gabriel Hicks. If you're a Critical Role fan, you probably know who those people are. Uh, a tactical semi-cooperative game. Okay. Okay. I mean, you know, we'll take a look. It's and it's always interesting when we can bring new people into our hobby, and they are definitely a brand name. Um. Yeah, I see we have, this kind of being in the vein of like the Kickstarterization of the industry where like Critical Role is big enough now that they can kind of do their own thing and they don't need to go to other publishers in order to get their content out and kind of go direct to consumers. Right. right. Um, they're calling it Darrington Press or Darrington Press. I'm not sure. I guess Darrington, um, which I'm surprised they didn't just call it like Critical Role. Maybe there's some licensing issues there, but right. But uh, yeah, Darrington Press is the critical role board gaming line. Uh, Blizzard, known for the video games that you love, uh, you being anyone who's listening, I would imagine. Uh, they have a uh, similar thing. They, a former vice president of Blizzard, uh, along with some other high level people there, have started War Chief Gaming, which is their own line of board games. They have yet to announce anything specific yet but um you know it's been fun watching riot do this they were sort of the first mm-hmm. in the gate sure. uh with mechs versus minions and they released that small strange bluffing game recently um but yeah always interested i mean i i few licenses get me more excited just on its own than blizzard licenses i'm i'm just a fanboy of everything that they've ever made for the most part as i've, I've had a massive obsession with so any good board game with a skin of one of those worlds that I love um, will be interesting to me as long as it's halfway decent, probably. So, yeah, give me a Hearthstone game and um, I'll probably buy it, sadly. <laughs> um, let's see. Next up, uh, in big board gaming news this week, we have uh, two big pre-orders that are available right now to order Wingspan Oceania, which is the third expansion for wingspan this one focuses on uh the birds of australia and new zealand um it is available for pre-order right now from stonemeyer games as well as your friendly local game shop it is apparently shipping in november or december um comes with 95 new bird cards that's a lot of new bird cards for me the more exciting part is the four new goal tiles i always like those and the five new bonus cards there is a new resource for the first time ever nectar adding to the resources we have there. Um, it also comes with uh, new dice as well, because you'll need new dice that have the nectar symbol on them. So I think you'll be replacing your dice from before. Um, and a whole bunch of new Automa cards, which is always good for me, because I like to play that game solo. If you are a Wingspan fan, head over there and check that out. Uh, the other exciting pre-order for me this week is Doom Imperium. Um I have now read the rule book, which they put up online, and it sounds interesting. I, I did pre-order the base game. They have two things available. You can get the $55 base game or cheaper if you can find it at an online gaming shop. I order directly from Direwolf 
uh, Digital, which is the publisher. Uh, and then for another 55 or so dollars, you can get a box of plastic minis to replace the wooden cubes. Um, so, so, so I don't know what this is. This is not the Dune board game. No. So and this, this is, is not, and this is not Imperial. This nope. is something else. This. So this is the Dune license from the vi from the new movie, which was supposed to come out before the board game, and which is now coming out a year after the release of the board game. Uh, all of the art in the board game is inspired by um, the actors and art of the movie, and it is a worker placement deck building game. So this is sort of a genre that is going to, at least in terms of two big games coming out this year, be a sort of a defining uh, genre of game right now. So we've got, um, oh God, I'm forgetting the name right now. Uh, something Arnak. I'm looking it up really quick. I have pre-ordered it as well. Uh, it is the Lost Ruins of Arnak and Doom Imperium are both deck building worker placement games. So literally what that sounds like is you're placing workers out on the board and some of those spaces will get you new cards that you add to your discard pile that get reshuffled back into your deck and the actions you take are the cards that you draw. Um, I would say Dune Imperium, after I've read the rule books of both now, Dune Imperium seems quite a bit heavier mm -hmm. than Lost Ruins of Arnak. Um, there's more asymmetrical powers. Of course, there's all of the usual factions you would imagine in Dune, Harkonnens and Bene Gesserits and Atreides. Um, and it seems, uh, this one seems interesting to me. Look, I'm a, I am a massive sucker for Dune. I, I'm pretty much, if it's not... If it's not Dune Munchkin, I'm probably going to buy it. You know, like if it's a halfway decent game, I I will give it a whirl because I just I can get in the IP and get uh, enjoying it so easily just from the world. The um, one thing I noticed about this, like, with, is that there's no map. Like this is not you know, this is not a dudes on the map game. I don't think. No, no, you are you are there are conflict cubes and worker placement spots, and so there's a whole conflict round that happens, and you're playing cards to put a certain amount of cubes in to decide how many of your cubes are going to be fighting, sort of influence that you have in the you know quote unquote war this round, um, and so there's that going on. There's also you're trying to get the influence of the different factions. Um, you're going to locations to get the resources you need to buy new cards that will make your actions better. And I'm, you know, I'm super into it, interested. I've also pre-ordered, um, uh, <laughs> this name does not stick with me, Lost Ruins of Arnak. I've also pre-ordered that, which is, is, is also a just straight up worker placement deck building game. Um, and they both, uh, or at least Lost Ruins of Arnak plays solo, which is why I've been interested in it. It's supposed to be very good solo. So yeah, those are two, uh, deck building worker placement games um dune imperium is available for pre -order right now i don't know exactly what that means like i'm curious to see what that means a worker placement deck building game because that doesn't naturally fit in my brain of what i expect gameplay to be right well in legends of arnak it, it's simply like you have a deck let's say you have a deck of 10 cards at the beginning of the game everybody has the same deck you draw five each one of those cards are actions so like you take your turn you play one action um that action could be to get some resources get some stuff and then you're also trying to go to locations and a lot of those locations are going to need certain cards in order to get there so if i want to go to this spot i need a jeep card which in order to thematically drive to that location and then i may encounter a monster at the location and I, I better have a couple combat cards in my hand if I want to be able to take it out. But then, it, you know, I can also go to the market and buy better combat cards or better Jeep cards or whatever I might need to help me, you know, be able to go farther and open up more locations in the worker placement board. That's at least how uh, Legends of Arnak works. Okay. I'm curious to see how that works or, or at Lost least where, where it <laughs> falls into like our, our deck building disc discussion later. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, both of these um, should deliver by the end of the year. So um, hopefully someone will put them online so we can actually try them together. Uh, Kickstarter news this week. The big Kickstarter going on right now is a game called Endless Winter Paleo Americas. Um, it is interesting for a handful of reasons. The artist of the game is uh, Mihala, Mihalo Dimitrievsky. Um, and that is, uh, the artist of all the Garfield, ga Garfield, Garfield games, games, uh, such as, uh, architects, of the West kingdom and, right. um, uh, Raiders of the North sea and et cetera. It's a very distinctive art style. Um, and it has a handful of, uh, well-known designers on it as well. Stan Kordonsky, who did dice hospital and Rurik and Johnny pack known for Sierra West and Cloma, as well as Drake Villarreal, who I believe this is uh, their first game. These, um, I thought I saw that these were from 
these designers were from Cyprus. Is that correct? That's well, Johnny Pack's from America, so oh, okay. so no. Um but yeah, it looks interesting. Um I definitely think it is well, the publisher worth... is. Okay, the publisher. Yeah, okay, the pub so yeah, so Johnny Pack is working then with the publisher of this. Um but it is funded and doing quite well on Kickstarter. Um I'm trying to find the link to it right now so I could give you a little information on it. Um my link is not working. Um but it is a, a 1 to 4 player game, 50 to 90 minutes. And uh, area majority, deck uh, deck bag or pool building, modular board, hand management. Um, yeah, check it out. It, uh, yeah, not, I think it's, I can't think of another publishing company from Greece. So that's interesting. The art is gorgeous, as you would imagine, from the artist. Well, this is um, Fantasia Games, and they're from Cyprus. And it's their first game, yeah. Um, so yeah, could be interesting. Uh, check that out if you're interested. Last bit of news. Um, and this is mostly exciting for me. I don't know if I'll ever get to play it, but I really want to play the Alien RPG. Uh, it has blown up the RPG world. It won all the awards last year. It did really, really, really well. Um, and it is now playable on Roll20. If you don't know what Roll20 is, it's basically tabletop simulator for RPGs. Um, but I think you have to pay a little money to use it. Um, yeah. But it's good. It, it has video support. It's a great platform. Yeah. So I would love to play Alien RPG. And an Alien RPG is interesting because it, it can either be a campaign or sort of a one night uh, role playing thing. So I would love if we could one day or one night put that together. I think that'd be really fun. Um, lastly, Tom mentioned last week that the Charles S. Robert Awards, uh, which is sort of the Oscars of war games in the board game world, was about to announce their 2019 winners. We have those winners now. Um, there are a lot of awards here. So if you go to charlieawards.wordpress.com, you can see all of them. But the most interesting here to me is uh, a wonderful Wargame Euro hybrid from last year, which won a whole ton of awards here, which is Nevsky, Teutons, and Russ in Collision 1240 to 1242. Um, Volko Runke is the designer of that, who uh, was the beginner of the coin series, as well as Labyrinth, a fantastic designer. I think Nevsky is fantastic and very interesting um, and worth looking into. And it was nice to see it get. It's a beautiful uh, game. It's great looking. Gorgeous. Game. The art is gorgeous. The game and the game is it's one of those games that when you, you first learn it and you go, uh, there's nothing that feels like this. It's and it's rare for me, you know, in my 11th year now in the, in the, in the hobby to play a game that literally feels like nothing I've ever played before. So um, hats off to uh, Volca for that. And, and it is a. Uh, series just like coin and the next one i think is coming you know in the next six months or so which is interesting well t you've played it right so it's it's kind of one of these games that has the opportunity of kind of crossing over between the war gaming world and the board game world yeah right? much like coin exactly yeah it is it is a war game where the only part of war that you are focused on is supply lines it is a game of making sure that you have direct supply lines at all time uh, in order to keep your conquest going. Um, and yeah, it's very much resource management and, uh, all of your mercenaries are, um, uh, paid for hire and they're, they're all on a timer. And after a certain amount of time, uh, they'll leave you because you only paid them for a certain amount of time. So you have to time your campaigns out, in a certain number of rounds and make sure that you achieve your goals by then because your whole army just disappears on, you know, the first of November. So you better have done something by then. Um, it's, there's a lot of really interesting, cool stuff happening there. Um, and yeah, like, you know, like coin games, there's a lot of card play going on as well. And it's one of those games where you, you sort of need to know the available cards that you and your opponent who are playing sort of asymmetrical decks have. Um, but yeah, very heavy. I mean, four four point three four point five weight i'd put it at Ooh. um really <laughs> heavy very like 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 playing coin with the ai heavy like <laughs> a lot going on um but also just one of those things that's like hard to grok because there's you don't have any uh comfortable footing you're not like oh okay i know this mechanic and every mechanic is like what explain that again um but yeah nevsky is totally worth looking into 
Um, and, I remember and much I had like one cool. bit of news. I had one bit of news here. Oh, the end, yes. So. Go ahead. Yes, please. I just in in my preparation for doing the Concordia review today, I clicked on designer Mac Gertz and saw that uh, he is working on Transatlantic Two, which I I'm not sure whether like this is a sequel or it's a reworking of Transatlantic, which is a game that you know you and I played at Essen uh, yeah. three years ago, and I liked it quite a bit. But it didn't didn't seem to break out. Um, and so anyway, you can go and check out Transatlantic 2 on BGG. And it looks like the change that the designer has made is to add a kind of map of the world to it so that it, the game, in a sense, becomes less abstract and a little more uh, map based in terms of shipping lines and stuff. But I, I thought this was a very good game. Um that maybe it's a little bit like uh, automobile, mm-hmm. kind of a good, a good you know comparison there. Which is automobiles, Martin Moore, Wallace, right? Yeah. And um, let's hope we're right about that. Um, but yeah, like it's kind of abstract in terms of what you're doing, and maybe it needed to be a little bit more concrete in terms of you know doing shipping lines across the Atlantic Ocean or something like that. But uh, I'm a, I'm a Matt Gertz fan, so I'm interested to see this reworking of what I thought was already a, a pretty good game. Yeah. I really like transatlantic. I, I sold it purely because there was just no enthusiasm for it in our group. Um, and it seemed Which to is be weird, one of those games. Right? Like why, it, we, you know, it is one of those things of like, why do some certain games stick and what I other think it's a tough like- teach. I think it's one of those games that it just, it really, it, it even took us a while to sort of wrap our brains around it. And the rule book, which we'll all, we'll talk about Matt Gertz rule books today. The rule book was <laughs> awful and genuinely didn't explain major important mechanics within the game that we had to rely on uh board game geek to explain to us. Um, which is a shame yeah. because it's a. I thought it was a pretty elegant game, so it should have been yeah. a pretty straightforward teach. But yeah, mate, let's revisit that in Concordia. Yeah, and I and Transatlantic Two for me would be an instant buy because even though I sold the first one, I liked it a lot, and just it was one. It's like Dominant Species Marine. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, if, if this solves all my problems from it, it could be a Grail game for me. You know, mm-hmm. could be like totally awesome. Hey, if you enjoyed that video, you very well might enjoy the other videos you now see being suggested to you on screen. Also, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could like, share, or subscribe to our Game Brain channel. Thanks so much.